pleasure now to invite David to speak to tell us about the arrow of time. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Well, thanks very much, Karen, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, on the 50th anniversary uh, of the July lectures, uh, I thought it would be appropriate um, to spend a few moments uh, looking back uh, at what the world was like in uh, 1968. Um, let me just see if I can persuade those lights to go down. Oh, there we go. Um, because the world uh, was very different. And we are connected to that world of 1968, 50 years ago, by the arrow of time, which has moved us forward uh, 50 years. Uh, but uh, there's nothing in physics, actually, uh, in, in classical physics, that says that uh, we should move forward in time or any other direction for that matter. And I want to uh, discuss that uh, problem and resolve it uh, tonight. Uh, don't forget, we've got uh, three more to follow this one. We'll come back to this at the end. So the other uh, thing that we want to pay, uh, uh, the other event we want to want to pay homage to this year is the passing of Stephen Hawking, who made absolutely fundamental uh, contributions to our understanding of space and time. And uh, next week, uh, we'll hear a lot about his uh, contributions uh, to the advancement of physics. And I just wanted to highlight the table of contents of his famous book, A Brief History of Time. Uh, these uh, chapter headings and the luminaries he, luminaries, luminaries he cites in the appendix are going to feature very prominently in my lecture tonight. Uh, just before I go back to 1968, there's another eight chairs available down here in the blue room for those of you who are standing in the doorway. You're very welcome either to go back out and go down the outside stairs or you can just walk down and uh, take a seat, please. Uh, the only hazard, you might get showered with high energy particles, but I'm sure it'll be all right. <laughs> and I think there are, are there two free seats uh, in the corner down here? Yeah, there, there are two uh, free seats if you want to come down here. Right, think, is that all? Are there any other vacancies anywhere in the front? No, okay, great. All right, uh, so the world in 1968, although I'm a physicist, I am alert to the fact there's a lot of politics going on out there. There's some culture, transport, technology, oh, that's my favourite, money, not so favourite, music and football, not favourite at all, but a lot of physics goes on. So let me just remind you of politics, 1968, John Gorton was our Prime Minister, that's changed. <laughs> culture. 1968, the greatest science fiction movie of all time was released, 2001, A Space Odyssey. If we fast forward 50 years, well, I already told you it was the greatest science fiction movie of all time. <laughs> that uh, status hasn't changed, obviously. Transport, this was the Melbourne Transport Plan, developed in 1968, released in 1969. This proposed installing a railway line to Monash University. If we fast forward to 2018, we see such a railway line is still being proposed. <laughs> In transport, 1968 saw the first flight of the beloved jumbo jet that made mass air travel uh, financially accessible to uh, uh, most of us. It was uh, an absolutely revolutionary uh, technology of the time. Uh, just one year later, uh, the Concorde uh, took its first flight, uh, offering uh, uh, air travel uh, to 100 passengers at uh, two and a half times the speed of sound. A truly astounding uh, technology. So therefore, when we fast forward uh, 50 odd years to 2018, we're all travelling... Uh, no, we're not. Uh, what we got instead, what we got instead, ladies and gentlemen, was this. Uh, I, I think we lost our way somewhere there. But, but the point I'm making here is that the laws of physics have not allowed us to give uh, mass air travel uh, at two and a half times the speed of sound, sadly, because the fuels that we have available are simply not powerful enough. 
Uh, if we had more powerful fuel, fuels, the shape of the aircraft would be very different. This aircraft shape is determined by the energy density of the highest power fuels we have available, namely liquid hydrocarbons. Actually, there is one that's more powerful, but, but you won't like it, so we'll just leave it right there. <laughs> in computers in 1968, the Intel uh, 40 uh, 404 uh, computer chip was designed and fabricated and then released onto the market in 1971. An astounding 2,300 transistors in the chip. Uh, they were available uh, for of the order of uh, a few hundred dollars. Uh, so with those 2,300 transistors, uh, that was 20 million nanodollars per transistor. Not a very convenient unit, maybe more convenient to say they were 0.2 cents per transistor in this CPU chip, which was uh, remarkable for the time. However, if we fast forward to 2016, unlike aviation, the laws of physics have been exploited almost to the full, at least the classical laws of physics have been exploited almost to the full, and now you can get a Pentium chip uh, with 1 billion 750 million transistors uh, and that works out to be only 10 nanodollars per transistor. That is astonishing. No human being in history has ever owned nearly 2 billion artificial artifacts at a price of only 10 nanodollars per transistor. So the march of technology, the applications of the laws of physics over 50 years have been truly remarkable in the field of computers. In 1968, Apollo 8 went into orbit around the moon and this picture of Earth rising above the lunar surface uh, it posed all sorts of uh, philosophical questions of looking back on the only planet we know in the universe that sustains life. It was truly, uh, truly moving. And if we fast forward to 2018, the Curiosity rover uh, is now enveloped in a planet-wide uh, dust storm, but uh, fortunately soldiers on uh, because its nuclear power uh, supply uh, doesn't depend on the sun, whereas poor old Opportunity halfway around the planet has gone into hibernation as the dust storm cut off the sun to its solar panels. Wow, 1968, this is what a telephone looked like, children. <laughs> uh, and not so children. And if we fast forward to 2018, this is what a telephone looks like. And a telephone, being a telephone, is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of what it actually does. You'll notice this one saying, hi, how can I help? Ooh, that's a bit scary. <laughs> this is what you used to have to carry around if you wanted all the functions of that telephone and more besides. And now, of course, it's all gone into the phone. Ladies and gentlemen, there's been a lot of talk about Western civilization in the newspapers lately. You want Western civilization? I'm giving you Western civilization right here. 1968, this was a two year old dollar bill. Today, of course, uh, no, no, not yet, not yet. Bitcoins, I don't think are ready. Uh, 1968, the Hazelwood Power Station kicked into full power and began generating two gigawatts of electricity in our state. If we fast forward, uh, Loi Yang A is generating two gigawatts of electricity for our state. Okay, well, that's not a good story. Okay, 1968, uh, Top of the Pops was Hey Jude by the Beatles. And I wouldn't mind betting even the young people in this audience can hum the tune to Hey Jude. Whereas in 1968, if you ask me to hum the tune of the Top of the Pops from 19... 18, I would have had no idea. This is remarkable. And we're listening to it, well, I was listening to it in 1968 on my crystal radio, uh, running a wire up to the top of a tree, connecting it up. Here it is if you want to have a look inside. No batteries, just a tuned circuit and a, a point contact uh, diode and a crystal earpiece, and I could listen to Hey Jude. And in fact, all those other tunes, many of which I'm sure most people in the audience can hum along to, all 40 of them, because they're still popular today. Uh, but now, of course, we've gone to the digital radio era. And, um, oops, sorry, uh, and uh, last but not least, football, very popular in this, uh, yeah, what a thriller, three-point victory to Carlton, very low-scoring game, it was terribly windy 
All right. But in 1968, there was also the first uh, of the four July lectures in physics. And these four lectures covered the four great themes that we have addressed over and over again in each of the lectures over the past 50 years. Gravity and inertia, temperature, electromagnetic waves, particles and waves, quantum mechanics in other words. Uh, and uh, Tony Klein is still with us and he's promised to come in next year to give a lecture on the Apollo missions. But he said in 1968 his aim was to discuss entropy and temperature and the rate and the direction in which it increases. So I've made the theme of my lecture also the direction, namely the arrow of time. I don't have a picture from 1968, but I do have a picture of the 20th anniversary from 1988, from left to right, not including the guys in the penguin suits, that's Professor Keith Nugent, uh, the late uh, prof uh, Professor Graham Sargood, uh, Tony Klein, who's stu still with us, and the late Professor Jeff Opat. And the fact that this was taken in 1988 or 2018 wouldn't matter because the three gentlemen there haven't changed a bit in all the years I've known them, uh, which I first met them in the mid-70s when I was an undergraduate. Now, just uh, how do you do justice to 200 lectures over 50 years? So let me just say that there were four uh, distinct themes uh, of the July lectures in that time. Relativity and Einstein, quantum mechanics, technology and particle physics, namely the Higgs boson. So if we just list some of the highlights from the past 50 years, you can see how relativity, general relativity, special relativity and gravity features over and over again until in 2016. Finally, 100 years after Einstein proposed them, uh, gravitational waves were discovered. Likewise, uh, with the Higgs boson, all these lectures leading up on the discussions of fundamentals of particle physics uh, set the scene for the big announcement of the discovery of the Higgs here in Melbourne and simultaneously in Geneva uh, of the Higgs boson. Then of course in quantum mechanics, too many lectures to mention, but the impact on our civilization of applications of quantum mechanics uh, you've already seen, all the way up uh, to the um, uh, fast emerging technology of quantum information technology, something that would not have been imagined back in 1968. And in the technological world, the World Wide Web and our com global communication system has transformed and is continuing to our tr transform our society, even though it's proving now from its uh, impact on politics and the echo chambers that have developed uh, as, as having negative impacts. But I'm sure over the next 50 years, we'll figure out ways to manage that. So now let me turn to the topic of my lecture tonight, namely the physics of time. So, time, it's different to space, or is it? So, historically speaking, uh, time was always with us. We always had a time base for measuring the passage of time. Uh, I think it's that one. Oh, so, I think I just have to use a, a Maxwell's laws to change the capacitance of this screen and it will ah, cooperate. Uh, so uh, the, the, the origin of time, the, the original of timekeeping of course is the uh, daily motion of the sun through the sky and although it's not so easy to see this I invite you to come down and uh, turn the handle yourself and uh, this is our orrery that we use in our telescopes for schools program. And you see the celestial clockwork of the planets, uh, including our own, orbiting the sun, uh, the moon, if you count that, if you're watching carefully, you just saw the moon go around 12 times when the earth w went round once. Uh, and, and this was the prototype uh, clock. Now, um, the next, uh, and it's a good, very perfectly good clock, if you're uh, not uh, in a hurry. However, uh, in the uh, 16th and then 17th century, uh, more accurate clocks began to be developed uh, based on, first of all, the pendulum, uh, first of all, the human pulse. Galileo sitting in church 
uh, looking up at the swinging of this uh, incense burner that had just been lit, uh, he timed uh, the swings, the, the how long it took to swing backwards and forwards by counting uh, his pulse. He would have had to sit there very calmly so he didn't get excited about anything, not, not the least of which would be uncovering a law of physics which can make you quite excited but you have to stay zen-like calm so his pulse was a good time base. And he discovered that the time for one oscillation uh, was independent of the amplitude of the oscillation. So as the uh, swinging got less and less, as the energy gradually dissipated through air resistance and friction, what have you, the time it took to go from one extreme to the other remained constant. It depends only on how long the pendulum is. And so this became the time base for a more accurate clock when you needed to subdivide the day into finer intervals than is possible just by watching the motion of the sun. But today uh, you can buy off eBay a cesium atomic clock uh, that provides a time base uh, with a precision of 2 by 10 to the minus 10 over a period of one second. This is phenomenally high precision. It, it uses ionised cesium atoms in a magnetic field uh, for, for $1,500. It's a bargain. What Galileo could have done with that? And today, uh, the most precise clocks are already in space as part of the global positioning system to get the phenomenal precision that we now take for granted and NASA is now propagating the global positioning system, no longer should be called the global positioning system, but the solar system positioning system to these deep space atomic clocks that will enable satellites to navigate through the so uh, solar system with unprecedented precision. Uh, the mercury ions in the magnetic traps in these satellites uh, have a precision of only one billionth of a second, losing only a billionth of a second over a period of 10 days. That's <coughs> astonishing technology. So now if we turn, we can measure time to extraordinarily high precision. Let's now turn uh, to the physics of the time, what the master said. So Galileo uh, introduced the first relativity principle and said that the laws of physics don't depend on absolute motion, but he didn't know about electromagnetism. Newton came along and extended Galileo's principle and introduced the concept that uh, the universe is governed by a majestic clockwork. These are his words where all clocks everywhere at all times tick in perfect synchronisation. Now Newton was a genius and he recognised this was only an assumption and he didn't have any data for it, but he had to start somewhere and from there he proceeded to develop the whole edifice of classical physics building on the foundations laid by Galileo. And of course this turns out to be correct, this turns out to be correct, well two out of three isn't bad. Uh, Einstein came along and said that the passage of time is not ticking everywhere in majestic synchronisation, the passage of time is relative. So let me first now talk about time and space. Here's a map of our neighbourhood. By the way folks, there, I think there are still two more chairs in the blue room down here if anyone uh, if anyone who's standing wants to sit down and there are a few do-it-yourself stairs chairs there too if you want to unpack them. You can get, get there down the back stairs or please uh, make yourself comfortable. Okay so this is a map of our neighbourhood with the university uh, and over there is the Edinburgh Gardens where there's a band rotunda. Now if you want to navigate from the university to the Edinburgh Gardens to hear a concert in the rotunda you need a coordinate system. So you need to know how far east to go and you need to know know how far north to go. Now this is a weird map because this is a map from the early days of the metric system. It's a little known fact, actually it's not fact at all, it's false, but just pretend it's a little known fact, that uh, to ease the transition from the imperial system of units uh, into the metric system, people had to measure distances to the east in kilometres but were still allowed to measure distances to the north in miles to help them get used to the idea. So here we go, uh, the uh, Edinburgh Gardens 2.5 kilometres east and 1.1 miles <laughs> north. Now, you know, this might be a little bit inconvenient, but thanks to the uh, laws of mathematics uh, developed by Pythagoras, uh, the distance from the physics department is easily computed by means of a conversion factor, 1.6, and we get 3.1 kilometres just to be sensible. Okay, now, so far so good. This is now, uh, the transition is complete, they were miles, 
Now here it is in kilometres and we can abandon the old imperial system once and for all after that difficult transitional period. Now imagine uh, there's an eccentric band of uh, navigators out there and they prefer not true north but magnetic north which is 11 degrees and 30 second, uh, 37 uh, minutes uh, to the east of true north. That's the direction your compass needle points and that's because the north magnetic pole is inconveniently located in Canada instead of at the north rotational pole like it would be on a sensible planet. So once again you can uh, work out the coordinates of the Edinburgh Gardens relative to physics. I'm calling them X prime and Y prime to distinguish them from X and Y and we apply Pythagoras, it works just fine. You still find it's 3.1 kilometres. Now what's the point of this? It's, it doesn't matter what coordinate system you use or what units you use, some things should stay the same and everybody should get the same result. Right, now, now, here and now, I am. Here I am. Here and now. Here and now. Now, that's, that's to me something rather special because it's where I am. It's my identity here and now. Oh, that's just disappeared into the past. Oh, here I am here and now. So there's something special about here and now. It's something I carry with me. I'm always here, regardless of how you move around in this weird way you're wandering about all over the place, but I'm still here, right there. Here, not there, here. Now, I can draw another map, this time including the time direction, which is after all the point of this lecture. So here is time proceeding into the future at the usual rate of one second per second. And you can see my here and nows being left behind as I move into the future at the usual rate of one second per second. This defines my time axis. But I'm not going to fall into the trap of that ridiculous transition from imperial units to metric. I'm going to use the same dimensions for the time axis on my map of metres, not seconds meters, no transition necessary here. So my constant of conversion is going to be the speed of light, one billion kilometers an hour. So that allows me to map my time axis in terms of meters. Just a conversion constant to change the units. And here's my space axis that I draw through my here at zero. And I recognize that out to the um, West, to the left, there's that way, yes, there's Carolyn Springs. Out to the right, towards the east, there's Box Hill along my space axis. Now, there we are. There's my coordinate system that I can use to map things. And there's a couple of flashes of light. One started way out west, zoomed away towards the east and crossed over where I'm standing here and now and continued on its journey to the east and there's another one that started out to the east and it zoomed out in all directions and crossed over here and now at the same time as the other one. These are just uh, conveniences for helping me plot things on this diagram. Now, imagine you lived somewhere out in the west. You were uh, hanging around at home, you were hanging around at home located somewhere out in the west and then oh it's time to come to the university to go to the July lecture. So you headed towards the university at constant speed until you reached the lecture theatre. Then you sat through the lecture without changing your position here and then you turned around and went home again until you went back to your place out in the west where you stayed fixed. This green line is your trajectory through space and time. It's called a world line. Now, the reason why I drew those two flashes of light is because I can use those flashes of light to divide this map into two, soon to be three, regions. One region is called the past. Everything that happened in the past relative to here and now lies on this part of the map in the red triangle. 
everything that will happen in the future that can be influenced by what happens here, here and now is in the top cone I've labelled the future. Everything else on this map lies elsewhere. <laughs> not in the past, not in the future. As long as you stay here and now, which you can't, nothing that happens elsewhere can have any effect on you. If there's a supernova out near Carolyn Springs, no problem. Of course, in the future, some of that radiation may hit you. But as long as you stay here and now, that happened elsewhere. Look at the person next to you. They're elsewhere. Because you're seeing them as they were in the past. Because you've moved from here and now. But eventually, you can see them. Oh. Okay, future, past, and elsewhere. Now, here is me in four dimensions. Simplified uh, diagram. That's my trajectory, my three score years and ten, and my perambulations through space. If I take a cross section of this four dimensional object, three spatial directions, width, depth, and height, some of those dimensions are expanding, but that's not a relativistic <laughs> effect. And the fourth dimension of time, I look like a long, wiggly, pink worm. If I take a cross-section of this four-dimensional object, and the cross-section of a four-dimensional object is a three-dimensional object, down near the start, I look like that, artist's impression. And if I take a cross-section towards the top end, I look like that. But if I take a cross section around now, uh, I look like I look like that. Well, that's what it looks like on the inside. Yeah. But obviously that's Brian Cox, not, not me. Anyway, all physicists think they look well, anyway, never mind. Now, this is a different way of looking at your life because this shows all your possible here and nows from beginning to, to the end. Now, this marvellous movie called Arrival, which was very difficult to understand, discussed a technique for extracting the world line from the laws of physics. It's based on what we call in physics Lagrangian dynamics. It's a means of recasting Newtonian physics into a form that allow you to pluck out the equation for the world line of a, a, a particle, as it, a, a, its whole picture in position and time. And the aliens were desperate to try and convey the method of doing this. Only the young lady understood it. The physicist had no idea what was going on, which was very disappointing. There's no good shouting from the audience, hey, it's Lagrangian dynamics, for God's sake. Get with it. Uh, and that's why the timeline of this movie, movie is so erratic, because the lady already figured out the uh, whole uh, world line of her life, and she jumps backwards and forwards along it as she, as she lives through the story in the movie. Anyway, I digress. It's obviously not very sensible to look at uh, a map of space and time close to here and now. Much better to step, step back and look at the big picture. So there can be no bigger picture than this. Let's put in the here and now. Let's put in the light cone that points back into the past. And there it intersects the beginning of time, the Big Bang. We look back into the past, into our past, when we look into the sky. Because it's taken a long time for that stuff to get here. We're looking into our past. We recognise that we don't see everything. For example, here's the age of quasars. Fortunately, there are no quasars left anymore, so we don't see any nearby. We only see them a long way away. Fortunately for life, they've all burned out, and we're safe here and now. A little later, we see the formation of galaxies, or the continued evolution of galaxies, uh, and the formation of the Earth, of course, uh, inferred. And this is what we see in the past. We recognise that there could be things outside of our past that still lie elsewhere. Let us hope that when we look into our past, we're seeing a representative sample of the universe. 
let's hope there's none of this going on. <laughs> Otherwise, I haven't got anything to tell you about. <laughs> now, let's imagine passing through the lecture theatre is something moving really fast with a different here and now. Namely, this fast spaceship carrying its green here and now and leaving a trail of here and nows through the lecture theatre. And so that defines the time axis for that fast green here and now. Perfectly valid, just as mine is perfectly valid. And the space axis will therefore, for sound geometrical and physical reasons, be symmetrically placed about that flash of light world line that I drew in at the beginning. This means that if I now ask the green world line, what are the time and space coordinates of the tuba concert in the rotunda at the Edinburgh Gardens, I know what they are, the blue ones. Well, the green ones will appear as so. They move back towards the origin. This is the true nature of space-time. It is non-Euclidean. This is Minkowski space-time. Einstein's physics teacher invented this concept. You can see the coordinates moving back to here and now. If we get an even faster spaceship so that the time axis tilts over even more steeply, there's the trail of here and nows, there's the time axis, there's the space axis, there's the rotunda, and you see now the spatial and time coordinates have moved even closer down towards here and now. And ultimately, of course, here's a flash of light moving forwards in time into the distance at the speed of light. Now the time and the space axis have coalesced. All of the coordinates, whether time or space, have gone to the origin. The entire universe has collapsed to one point for an object moving at the speed of light. Not a very convenient way of looking at the universe, I would say. But that is time and space. All right. I'll come back to that in the second last slide. Now, time and gravity. Whoa. The Leaning Tower of Pisa was where Galileo, according to legend, did experiments with falling objects. We can also press this into service to understand time and gravity. Here are two identical atoms. One is low, one is high. They both have the same mass, they're identical, so I can work out the total amount of energy using E equals mc squared. Then I can hit one with a photon, a special photon that, that excites one of the electrons into its uh, first allowed excited state and the photon is absorbed and I have an excited electron represented by the star. Then I can allow that atom to decay, which is now heavier than it was before, by the amount of energy in the photon, I'll call it m star c squared, where m star is greater than m, I can allow it to decay and carry the energy up until it's absorbed by the high atom, which is now of mass m star compared to m for the low atom. So now I have a perpetual motion machine. I connect the heavy atom up to a very fine piece of string over a pulley, and I use gravity to lift the light atom up to be the high atom where the heavy atom falls to the low point. And then I can repeat this over and over again. Clearly this is wrong. And what's wrong is that when the photon attempts to make this endless cycle, as it climbs uh, in the gravitational field, it loses energy. It loses energy uh, given by the amount of potential energy of the uh, gravitational field. So by the time it gets to the top atom, it's not blue anymore, it's red. It's been red shifted. The wavelength has got longer because of the conservation of energy. And in general, it'll have the wrong energy and won't be absorbed. So this prevents, this is the laws of physics, preventing the construction of a perpetual motion machine, but at the cost of the time axis, because this is actually the same photon. It's got the same number of oscillations and all the rest of it. So the only way we can understand what's happened here is to say the photon that was being measured 
at the bottom must have been measured with a dodgy slow clock. So it appeared to have a higher frequency because the clock was running slow than when it was at the top of the tower. The gravity has caused the clock, the low clock, to run slow. So photons appear to have a higher energy. Not appear, do have a higher energy. And this was an outrageous prediction of Einstein's and it took a long time, 60 years, before uh, sufficient uh, physics uh, skills could be developed to test it. This is Harvard University. There's a tower in the middle of the physics building, the Jefferson Lab. They put a radioactive source at the bottom and an absorber at the top. They were communicating uh, girls and boys by an early uh, primitive version of the telephone. You can see here where you, you have to be connected by wires, you know. And they, just to, uh, for finesse, they used a, a long uh, mylar tube uh, that was full of helium so that the radiation from the radioactive source uh, could be transmitted without uh, too many losses because this was an extremely radioactive source and you'd never be able to allow to do this today. But because of the Mossbauer effect, they were able to detect the very slight energy shift and therefore the time shift over the height of the physics building at Harvard. One, uh, 2.4 times 10 to the minus 15, different from one. So a very slight effect. It used the Mossbauer effect, as I mentioned, and there's a wonderful Mossbauer effect experiment in our undergraduate labs. Uh, Rudolf Mossbauer uh, wrote a one-page appendix to his PhD thesis uh, when he was only a very young man, and that was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1961. Yes, it is possible to get a Nobel Prize for a one-page idea. <laughs> so now you can apply Einstein's theory across the solar system, and this is my attempt to show the time map of the solar system. The depth of these uh, red bars indicate the rate at which clocks slow down owing to the gravity on the surface of each of these objects. So uh, the sun has the strongest gravity. It differs from one by two by 10 to the minus six, the clock rates compared to outer space. Earth is much more feeble, so the time differs only by seven by 10 to the minus 10. But in the movie Interstellar, they went to this planet uh, here in orbit around a black hole where the gravity was so strong that the rate of time corresponded to one hour on the planet to seven years in the orbiting uh, spaceship. Uh, wow, uh, you know, I'm inclined to ask, well, what sort of fuel did they use for getting off the planet and returning again? But that would be a spoil sport. It's a nice story. So there, in case you're not familiar with scientific notation, is the rate difference between your clock, which ticks for one second, but the clocks in the satellites in orbit around the Earth, far from the Earth's gravity, uh, they see your clock ticking at 1.0000000007 seven seconds per second. It's running slow by this small amount. Small, but not zero, and so the GPS uh, clocks have to worry about this. Uh, they run fast after you correct also for the time dilation effect from the speed of the orbit by 39 millionths of a, per second, uh, millionths of a second per day, which would correspond to a positioning error of 12 kilometres if this general relativistic effect uh, was not uh, corrected. Now, the last part of my lecture is to deal with the problem of time in physics. In physics, we normally start with an equation. It might be conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, or whatever other law of physics is appropriate that constrains the way a physical system can behave, and then we have to find the way the system behaves subject to that constraint. So if someone stops you in the tram on the way home tonight and say, did you see Schrodinger's one-dimensional time-dependent wave equation in the lecture tonight, you can say, yes, I did. And the solution to this equation tells the trajectory of the quantum mechanical particle through time. But there's a problem with this equation. There's nowhere in this equation for the privileged status of now. It's just an equation that stands serene, independent of the flow of time. Where does now go into this equation? 
This is not a silly question, as I'll explain in a moment. Also, even worse, where do, how does this equation tell you about the direction of time? Because one thing's for sure, we can tell the difference between going forwards in time, we get wider, to going backwards in time. Let me explain the problem from a quantum mechanical perspective. This is work of relevance uh, to what Karen mentioned at the beginning uh, for our contribution to the quantum computer project. Our quest is to build a 10 qubit quantum computer in the next five years. This is an extremely ambitious goal and we plan to encode information on the quantum mechanical state of electrons and nuclei in silicon. Here's a phosphorus atom which I have inserted in my lab with the assistance of my students and my postdocs, one atom, that's 1.0 atoms, not one plus or minus one on a good day, into a block of silicon which will be the qubit for our device. My colleague Lloyd Hollenberg has then calculated the quantum mechanical wave function, the solution to that equation on the previous screen for the electron in orbit around this phosphorus atom inside the block of silicon. That's great, but it's serene and independent of time or the concept of now. You might prefer this model. This is the classical picture of an electron orbiting an atom in a block of silicon. And we now put this in a special machine and measure the state of the electron. And we do not see that beautiful pattern that was calculated by Lloyd and his team. We see the electron there, now, here, well there, in the lab using our special single electron transistors and all the rest. What we have done has imposed on a pure quantum mechanical system here and now. We have decohered the electron from its quantum mechanical state as a wave function to a specific location which allows us to read it out and manipulate its quantum state. This is a little bit unnerving. Surely humans don't have to be in the loop into the laws of physics to impose a now on the eternal equations of physics. Don't look to me for an answer to this problem. I'm not going to give it to you because I don't know. Sometime in the next 50 years, one of my uh, people who supplant me will hopefully provide an answer to this. So now, the arrow of time. Uh, a good place to start uh, with the words, the moving finger writes and having writ moves on, nor all the piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel out half a line, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. Well, that's a pretty strong statement that time goes forwards. But the laws of physics are not so clear. I thought you might be interested in this movie I took in my office the other day. This shows my uh, coffee cup and it's uh, been recorded by uh, the aid of my uh, uh, very handy, um, if I can just, oh, here we go. Oop, no, sorry. Oh. Sorry, let me. Just get that back again. Has it come back? Yes. Uh. <laughs> Oops. Yes. Good. Uh. Okay. Uh, here's the movie. And it's not a very exciting movie because it just shows uh, a picture taken every two minutes. I don't have a very steady hand, so it looks like the cup's moving around. And you can see the cup gradually cooling. And here's a diagram showing it starting at about 80 degrees and cooling down to below 30 until I gave up and put it in the microwave and drank the coffee. <laughs> but I can show you a another movie. Another movie. Oops. Um, which is a bit unnatural, but is it? Hang on, let me just get that. Uh, no. Sorry, I've got a little mouse here. 
there. Look at this movie. It's the same movie as the last one, but I'm just playing it backwards. Now, there's nothing wrong about this movie. The conservation of energy is still obeyed. The cup is absorbing heat out of my office and warming up. The total amount of energy is exactly the same in both movies until finally it gets to its maximum temperature of uh, nearly 90 degrees Celsius. But clearly that movie is very unnatural because practical experience tells us that coffee cups never get hotter. And this is incompatible with Newtonian physics. Here are two particles interacting, obeying the Newtonian laws of physics. There they are after the interaction. Here's another two particles colliding and interacting and ending up in the new position. Those are two, for, two movies, forwards and backwards, which both perfectly obey Newton's laws. There is no arrow of time in Newton's laws. And yet we know this cannot be right in physics. Here is a nice demonstration of what's going wrong here. Whoa, 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 whoa. Here I've got two particles. Uh, they're moving around randomly. They're separated by a barrier. The red one's on the left. The green one's the other way. I can take the barrier away. They're now free to wander. And if I'm quick, eventually, I can put the barrier back in. And the system has spontaneously returned to the initial state. I hope I got that around the right way. Now, no arrow of time there. I can go play that forwards and backwards. I think I got them back to front, but it doesn't matter. You get the idea. With two particles, there was no arrow of time. Let me now slightly increase the number of particles. still with the barrier in place. Now let me remove the barrier. All right, I'm just gonna wait a moment until they spontaneously separate to the left and right. Hang on a sec. What time was breakfast coming? Clearly there's something fundamentally different about that system because that system shows very clearly an arrow of time. It started with all the colours separated, I removed the barrier, they mixed and they will never go back to the original configuration. Well they might, but we might be here for a very long time. So it seems that when you put a system of large numbers of particles, you suddenly develop the arrow of time even though it's not part of Newton's laws. So what's going on here? Well, this is the concept of entropy. Ludwig Boltzmann, show what is true, write so that it is clear. I'm inspired by that, his personal motto. I went and visited him, well, his grave anyway, in the general cemetery, the main cemetery in Vienna a couple of years ago, and engraved on his tomb is this equation that explains what's going on over here. It's an equation that links physics on the left-hand side, the concept of entropy, with multiplicity on the right hand side. By multiplicity, I mean the number, of conf the number of possible allowed configurations of the system. And this quantity entropy must always increase in the real world. So here's an example, here's 24 coins. And if I showed you this configuration of the 24 coins, you could say, well, that's good, but that's very unnatural. Because if you put those coins randomly, you would not get that. And so Boltzmann says, whoa, there's only one way you can arrange 24 coins to get 24 heads, and that's if they're all heads. So the entropy, according to my equation, says Boltzmann, is therefore zero. Now let's put a bit of energy in and start flipping them and see where they end up. Oh, here's one possible configuration. That's got 12 heads. 
There's another one. That's got 12 heads, but it's different to the previous one. So see, there are two possible configurations. And Boltzmann would say, well, there's lots of ways of getting 12 heads. This is a high entropy configuration, and this is how the system will evolve to if allowed to uh, obey the laws of physics. Not because of some new law of physics, just on the balance of probability. Here's another no entropy situation where all the heads have gone and we only have tails. Only one way to get that, that's a zero entropy configuration. So here's my calculation of the number of ways of getting 12 heads, well, getting any number of heads from zero up to 24 for those 24 coins. And you can see the number of ways of getting 12 heads and 12 tails is at the peak of this distribution. That's for only 24 coins. If I go to 100 coins, that peak becomes so large I can hardly fit the number on the screen. And if I go to 1,000 coins, I have to make an artist's impression because my Excel spreadsheet crashed when I tried to calculate this graph. And there's just one gigantic spike at 500 heads and 500 tails, 50-50 for 1,000 coins. And one of my uh, undergraduate students figured out how to do this in uh, Wolfram Alpha, and there's the number. 2.7 times 10 to the 299 is how tall that peak is for 50 head, uh, 500 heads and 500 coins, uh, tails for 1,000 coins. So if we were flipping 1,000 coins every second since the Big Bang, at the beginning of time, 4 by 10 to the 17 seconds ago, we'd still only within an additional 10 to the 284 ages of the universe of getting a thousand heads. So, as Boltzmann would say, don't even think about getting these low entropy outcomes. It's only the high entropy outcome that you're going to find in nature. So in our small system of just two particles, there are not many options available. So there's not very much entropy associated with this system. It can wander around forwards, backwards, whatever, and it's still okay by the laws of physics and the concept of entropy. But as soon as we go to a large number of particles, like the number of gas atoms in this lecture theatre, and I calculate there are about 2 by 10 to the 28 gas atoms in this lecture theatre, all bouncing around, I can ask, what guarantees that this half of the lecture theatre has oxygen to breathe? because Newton is perfectly happy with all the gas atoms to be found on the right-hand side of the lecture theatre. It breaks no law of physics. But it does break the concept of increasing entropy, because the multiplicity goes as the volume to the power of the number of gas atoms. The volume of the lecture theatre raised to the power of 2 by 10 to the 28. 10 to the power of 2 with 28 zeros after it. So if you halve the volume, you greatly restrict the number of possible arrangements of the gas atom in the lecture theatre. And so this is a very low entropy configuration on the right compared to the configuration on the left, and you are perfectly safe. Although the laws of physics are not going to save you from suffocation, the laws of entropy do. Whew. Big time, not just slightly. So the final thing I want to mention are the laws of uh, entropy and temperature. Right, Steve, I'm going to switch back to the, uh, to the uh, camera again. Let's hope that this uh, doesn't go pear-shaped, which I think it should be all right. We can go to here, we can go to here. And then we can go to here. That one. Oh, what I've got here is a whole se set of uh, small particles in a box, and I can put some energy in and shake them up. Now, it turns out it's too noisy. But I did this earlier, and as the particles shape up, they 
uh, escape through a hole over here and go into this dish where they're sorted as a function of energy. And you can start to see uh, this distribution here. Uh, so low energy ones, mid moderate energy ones and high energy ones. This is the Boltzmann distribution. This is what happens if you have a series of interacting particles uh, that are all the same. You always get this distribution uh, eventually. You never get a flat distribution. I can do that on a larger scale with this apparatus here where I've got a whole lot of larger particles. Just be careful over there, please. Which I can also excite. Oh, and now you see the Boltzmann distribution until they're all gone. Again, all of them are obeying reversible Newtonian laws, but they spontaneously form this uh, distribution. And another one which I really like is this one. Yeah, so here is another example of regularity in randomness where uh, this pegboard has got a whole lot of pegs which allow these particles to randomly scatter. Whoops. And again, even though everything is random and Newtonian, there's a certain regularity And over time, we'll converge on the highest entropy configuration, which is a Gaussian distribution. And you can see it's starting to emerge, even though everything is entirely random. OK, I'm having too much fun, but I realise you've got breakfast to go to. So the final thing I wanted to show you was this very unnatural object. Uh, this is a flask which has got uh, five white balls and five black balls. And uh, Steve gave this to me in this unnatural state because this is a zero entropy config or a very low entropy, almost zero entropy configuration. If I now invert the flask, oh, sorry, Steve, it's <laughs> randomize it a bit and put it up again. Oh, it's no longer in that nice low entropy state because there's a myriad of ways of getting that arrangement. And so that's absolutely more common than what I started with. Let's try again. No, another random state. <laughs> Whoa. Nah, nah. Entropy wins. The high multiplicity states form just about every time. It's only 10 particles. So, now, Obviously, what I've done in each of those demonstrations is put some energy in. And that energy uh, is usually in the form of temperature, what we call temperature, the agitation of the sample. Here we have the flow of energy from the sun and then the discharge of that energy into space. The energy coming from the sun has very low entropy because it's very hot. We can extract a lot of work out of that high temperature energy. But after we've processed it and dispersed it into a myriad of new configurations, even though we've never lost any energy, it's been dispersed in a myriad of different ways before it's discharged back into space at a very low temperature. So the Earth is creating entropy. It's taking in low entropy energy, which has a high temperature, not many configurations, all the energy is in a particular, uh, close to being in a particular state, then it's being filtered through the earth in a myriad of different ways, being dispersed right across the spectrum, the same amount of energy but now dispersed into myriad of new configurations 
and then dumped back into space, where it's now cold, a lot of entropy, and not very useful anymore. And I've tried to illustrate this with these red uh, spheres up here, which are the rate at which each of these systems dumps energy into the uh, dumps entropy into the environment. Ultimately, all our energy comes from the sun. In the sample on the left, that's my infrared camera at work again, it gets converted into food, it gets operated at 37 degrees Celsius and then radiated back into space. You can see I don't change the entropy, I don't increase the entropy of the energy very much. Likewise, a mobile phone also using chemical reactions. But in that aeroplane where the fuel burns at an enormous temperature, the amount of entropy created is enormous and that gives the, that gives the aeroplane its power the ability to dump enormous amounts of entropy, energy dispersed right across the spectrum and that's ultimately what powers it. Over here on the right is the city of Melbourne burning brown coal and it uh, burns at a relatively low temperature and so the rate at which we dump entropy is relatively low which means we've got to waste an enormous amount of energy because we're using a low entropy fuel. There are other fuels which have much less entropy. But don't get me started on that. <laughs> so to conclude, this is how it all goes together. This is uh, the uh, world line of the universe as a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional object, which is itself the cross-section of a four-dimensional system. But did you get all that? Yeah. <laughs> Down here at the Big Bang, there was no time, it's, there's only space. Remember that diagram I showed where the world lines come together and how clocks deep in a gravitational field run slowly? So there were no, there were no, there's no ticking going on down here. There's no passage of here and now into the future until something happened, something quantum mechanical that traded a bit of space into time and bang, the universe took off into the future. Before that, there was no past, there was no future, there was only space. And then lots of complicated things happened and eventually we appeared and began to evolve along the arrow of time. And the geometry of this whole complicated four-dimensional object is still being worked out today. So the future in just one slide. 50 years from now will be the 100th anniversary of the July lectures in physics. I hope I'm still around but I might not be. So let me tell you what you're in for. I reckon we're going to hear about breakthroughs from the first large-scale quantum computers maybe designing anti-malarial drugs using the laws of physics instead of test tubes or whatever is used today. That's a very urgent problem that I think physics is long overdue to tackle, but we need quantum computers to do it. Dark matter found at last, yes! I wish they'd hurry up. <laughs> the quantum mechanical picture of gravity and space-time is completely absent at the moment. So the role of now cannot be included in quantum mechanics until that reconciliation takes place. I'm being optimistic along my timeline. The role of physics in how life began. Surely it's a problem in physics. And then finally, practical thermonuclear power. The insight that made it possible 50 years out, always seems to be 50 years out. And there's no need to wait, ladies and gentlemen, because over the next three weeks, my colleagues will take you through some of these big themes and show you where we are today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, David. Uh, we might have a few quick questions. Um, oh, yeah. It's only got one, unfortunately. Is that one faded away? Oh, yeah. If you hold it really close, I think it'll work.
Yes. Does time go backwards in a black hole? Uh, my, in homage to Ludwig Boltzmann, I'll say definitely not. Uh, the entropy of a black hole uh, is now uh, well understood, and I think we have no evidence that it goes backwards. However, I have to have a caveat because what goes on really inside a black hole is going to depend on unifying quantum mechanics and gravity, and at the moment we don't know how to do that. So that's a provisional understanding that may change in the next 50 years, but it's a very good question. As far as we know, it still goes forward. Uh, professor, we know we can achieve a higher temperature than the surface of the sun by concentrating the sunlight at the rise of the Earth, which is kind of a bit like reversing entropy. Now, at the end of the universe, there was a huge, perfect mirror. Would not all the energy has been degraded down to even how, however diffuse it was, can it all be recovered again and, and come back to a um, maximum temperature? I think, I think you'll find when you uh, work it through that uh, a mirror or a funnel for that, mo that um, uh, matter uh, does not uh, decrease entropy. There will be, it will come at a cost, namely the momentum transferred to the mirror will transfer, moment, uh, transfer entropy into the environment. The mirror, the act of reflecting, generates entropy. Entropy is not conserved. You can generate as much entropy as you need to, and so the reflection process will indeed generate the entropy to compensate. So what, the second question. Light coming back to us from the edge of the universe. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a quantum mechanical uh, problem, and I think, as far as we know, the uh, vice chancellor at uh, the Australian National University showed, well, he got a Nobel Prize for it, showed that the universe was expanding, Brian Schmidt. So I don't think we're in for the, the big crunch. Thank you, Professor. Lovely lecture. I appreciate it. Thank you for your organising that. And then I appreciate that again. I want to talk about quantum physics and uh, time, but about that. Can you explain for us? If time illusion, how we measure illusion, for example, time will not go back if you measure black hole. Thank you. Well, I think I can just appeal to the laws of physics that shows that time always moves forward, driven by the relentless increase in entropy. So that's the answer. In 2018, and I'm confident it will survive yet another 100 years. Many of you have uh, dinner plans, so we might just uh, close off now and uh, really thank David for a great lecture and kicking off the series. Thanks, Colin. Thanks very much.